Okay, hi everyone. Take two for our episode three. And uh, it's Anthony here from Enlightened Business Solutions with our third episode of We Mean Business, uh, the talk show made for small business owners, where we'll be speaking with small business owners from across the country and providing some valuable information on various topics. Once again, I'd like to make it clear I'm not a journalist, not, uh, we don't have any agenda, I'm not affiliated with any political party or religious groups, and uh, all our shows will be live streamed to Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, with no cutting or editing, just raw and unfiltered uh, information. If there's something you'd like to know, send your comments through and we will take those on board and try and provide that uh, in the coming days. With everything going on at the moment, uh, we're doing a small segment on COVID-19 where we're hearing real stories from business owners across the country and how they're coping during these times in order to learn from their mistakes uh, and also from their successes uh, so that we can all come out of this a bit stronger than before. So today it's my great pleasure to introduce George Mavros from Etsy Consulting. George is a business coach who has been in sales and marketing for over 30 years and has represented over 300 companies uh, in various industries in that time. Uh, is an author and also been on TV. And like I mentioned the first time through this, I think there's very little you haven't done except for run for parliament. But uh, I guess there's still time for all of that. So, so welcome, George. G'day. Thanks, Anthony. And uh, if anybody's here for the second time round, I apologise. Um, thanks to the wonderful world of technology, my new computer died and we had to move back to my old computer. So sometimes old is better than new. <laughs> so, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, 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 uh, so we'll start with how do you describe yourself and, and your business? Okay. So basically, I'm a business coach and advisory service. Um, I, I concentrate on um, sales, marketing, business development, uh, personal development, and intellectual property. So in some ways, I defy, I defy that story about uh, be an inch wide and a mile deep. I, I would like to think that I'm a mile deep in the areas that I uh, work in, um, but my interest and my offering to clients is far wider. Um, I was introduced by a very good friend of mine about seven or eight years ago as the man of many hats. And he said, it's not about what George can do, it's about what you need done. And so I've sort of adopted that as, and I, uh, that was Dimitri Greco from uh, BusyNet. Um, and I told Dimitri I was going to steal that as an intro. And, and so that's how I see myself. I like to solve problems for people and um, uh, because of my background, there's a lot of problems that I seem to be able to solve. <laughs> yeah. So um, what brought you into the business and how long have you been doing this for? Um, well, I actually started I actually started selling from uh, a very young age. Um, I had my first business um, when I was 11. Um, I created a product and I created a, a particular uh, enterprise which made me a lot of money. And then I ran the card games um, at school and that earned me a lot of money. And so I, I was in sales and marketing before I even knew I was in sales and marketing. But at the age of 19 and a half, and the only reason I know that specifically is my birthday is the 5th of November. I actually started with Jeff Penny on the 5th of May in that year. So I was 19 and a half to the day. Um, Jeff was the person that brought Artline marking pens into Australia and um, he was the nearest thing that I have ever met to a self-taught born salesperson. He, just an incredible man, uh, was my mentor for many, many years. Um, as you know, Anthony, anybody that knows me for a while, they quite often hear another thing Jeff Penny taught me and what I learned at Artline. Uh, and so he, he helped me develop a professional attitude, and then I, I came across a fellow by the name of Tom Hopkins, who is still around today in his 70s, and if you haven't heard of Tom Hopkins and you want to be in sales and business in general, you should get a hold of Tom's material, and through him and Jeff, I brought the whole thing together. My selling style is consultative, so, so I don't go out and push, push, push. It's about working with my client, finding out what you need, and... So at about the age of 42, I suddenly went, you know what? I'm more a consultant than I am a salesman. 
and I actually like that part of it more than the actual selling side of it. Um, and so I committed myself to the sales and the and the business development and the coaching and and if you like um, uh, bringing on other people and giving back to a profession that served me so well for so many years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we've known each other for about 10 years and you were a coach of mine about 10 years ago. And of course, we still bounce it, uh, ideas of each other still today. So uh, I know the type of value that you bring to a business is quite unconventional and refreshing, I think, sometimes as well. But um, you've, you've, done the, you've done the two books so far um, and they're both really different. Um, what was your purpose when you were thinking about each of them? Well, the first one I did, um, which I will do a... Uh, uh, without any shame, a, a plug. Um, it's called, hey, look what I made. What do I do now? Um, that's because of my interest in patents, inventions, and people creating new and innovative stuff. And over the years, uh, people used to come up to me and say, look, I've created this, or I've made this, or I've got this idea. What do I do now? Um, so um, I was raising money for uh, cancer a few years ago and I lost a very good friend of mine to cancer. And so I, I wrote the book and uh, um, somewhere between somewhere between 20 and 100% of the sales um, goes to my various charities that I look after. Um, why I say it varies is because normally when we're selling the books, uh, normally I, I will always donate a percentage to charity but somebody might have an event on and I'll say, look, here's, let me come and do a talk. All the book, I'm, I'm there for free. Anybody that buys a book, 100% of the profits just goes straight to you. So, so I use it as a fundraiser. But I also, there's a section in the book that's called Funny Sayings. And um, um, I apologise ahead of time because I have to say it exactly as I tell people. So I will meet people and they'll say to me, oh, have you got a business card? And I say to them, no, no, I don't actually because, I, I, as you know, Anthony, I don't carry a lot of business cards, but I quite often yeah. have a copy of my book. And so I'll say to them, look, I've, I've written this book. There's a section in the back here that's called Funny Sayings. Have a read of that. If you're reading that and you think I'm a dickhead, don't ring me. If you're reading that and you like the way I think, you should probably ring me. Don't worry about the front end, but if you like the way I think and talk, give me a call. Now, what that's done for me over the years, it's pre-qualified people because if they ring me back, they like the way I think. And I've never had anybody that's rung me back and not become a client. So its purpose is to raise money for my charities, but it's also a wonderful business. It's a 12,000-word business card uh, and a great qualifying tool. And um, the success of it, one client I met about eight years ago so far has um, uh, earned me over $400,000 in um, fees doing patent work, consulting work, um, solving problems in uh, tribunals for him, doing all sorts of things. So uh, well and truly paid for itself for me and well and truly um, earned a lot of money for the charities. The other book is called um, Never Fear a Salesman Again. That's the one that actually got me on Channel 9 a few months ago. And the reason behind that is that I'm very proud of being a salesman and I, and I think the sales profession is fantastic. A lot of people think only people that sell products or services are salesmen. Some of the greatest people in the world at sales are teachers and parents. And if you stop and think about it, who wants an audience that has the attention span of a gnat, um, has got 55 other things to do, and now with, with games, a lot more, has no understanding of what algebra is going to do in their life, and you've got to stand up in front of 40 of this lot and, and convince them that learning about algebra and what happened in 1066 is going to do you value later on. So teachers are, are some of the best teachers in the world, they're some of the best salespeople in the world. And if it wasn't for our parents, seriously, how many of us would have gone to school? How many of us would have done our homework? How many of us would have gone to bed early? So if you can't sell, you can't communicate. But over the years, it's always upset me almost on a, on a weekly basis and sometimes a daily basis 
where I hear about people getting ripped off by the shonks and the sharks and the, the piranhas. And so never fear a salesman is to teach the average person the tricks of the trade because if I can teach you to be a better buyer, it'll push out the dud salespeople. Um and also, I'm, I'm hoping that yeah. that will take me into speaking engagements more. Yeah, yeah. No, they're both, they're both good books, and thank you for gifting some to me for Christmas as well. I've, I've handed them around. Um, so with the current environment, so I guess I'm, I'll know some of the, the answers to these questions, but, you know, in your own words, what do you make of the current COVID-19 situation and how has your business changed the result as a result? Um. So as you know, I'm involved in a few different uh, enterprises, Um, but in the coaching business in particular, um, uh, numbers of my clients just lost their business. Uh, One chap chap that I have uh, as a client, um, he goes around to pubs and clubs and he cleans out the the lines from the the keg all the way up to the tap. Uh, So once they shut down every pub and club, his business just disappeared overnight. Um, so for him, there was no way that he could restructure that to do something because if the pubs aren't open, if they're not using the lines, then they just don't need them cleaned. So he, we, we talked about a number of things and he managed to get himself a, uh, a job. So he, he just went straight into getting a job. He the, uh, the employment he's got, they know that he's there as a, as a um, just to get him through the COVID thing, but that's cool. They're happy. He's happy. And when we start to see the clubs um, open up and the pubs open up again, we've got a new package, which is going to be a spring clean offering. So what he's going to do is he's going to go back to all the clubs and say, look, just before you open up, let me come through and, and, and let me, clear those lines out for you and get them up and running. Now, he's already got about half a dozen people ready to go on that uh, as soon as we want to open the door. Well, with, good result, uh, yeah. With my own business, um, a lot of my consulting and, and coaching is is being done through Zoom. I'm having a lot more Zoom meetings now than I ever did before. Um, I'm not having the coffee chat, so uh, the QVB building in, um, in uh, Sydney where I used to do a lot of my meetings with people in the city. Uh, poor old Salini's on table 13. Uh, that's my city office. Um, they're missing out on some business. And, and uh, as you know, there's a number of places in Parramatta I go for my coffee chats. So so a lot of the work has been done that way. Um, with some of my clients, they've, they've, they're, they've re-manoeuvred and, and repositioned themselves. One of my businesses, um, I help inventors, as I said, and and we generally uh, um, market to people that have just filed a provisional application. So that's at the very, very beginning of of their their journey. Um, That's a 12-month period, and then you go to stage two. Um, Because of COVID, we've rearranged what we're doing, and we're actually approaching the people that are three months out from stage two not at the very beginning. And the reason for that is those people at the very beginning, they don't know what they're going to do at the moment because they're in panic mode. The people with three months to go before stage two, they have to make a decision and a decision they make could be very expensive. So so I've looked for the opportunistic business and the opportunistic sales. And um, a um, classic example of what's happened in COVID um, You've probably seen there's numbers of breweries that are that are making or distilleries that are making alcohol and things like that. Alcohol's crashed, no business there. Uh, there's a company um, in Adelaide that swung over to make um, sanitizer and hand sanitizer. Uh, went live on, uh, took their business uh, to the internet, sold four and a half thousand bottles in the first 45 minutes that they went live. Um, so, so it's that uh, the, the new buzzword of pivoting. Um, I like to just call it the old word of adapting. Yeah, yeah. There's some good stories there. I guess you know I'm I'm getting a, a, a you know a little bit of information about how, what I can do different as well. I mean, you've told me a number of times that you think uh, you know one of my books would be uh, an interesting read. 
Also, but do you recommend these kind of strategies for other businesses or, or what types of things do you recommend for, for a small business that might be doing it tough uh, at the moment uh, as, as a way that they could use the downtime or as a way that they could uh, adapt to the current environment? Okay, so when COVID started and when they when they started to move into the lockdown mode, I, I, I adopted two strategies. My first strategy was that I was going to lose my entire income or my entire earnings within three weeks. Now, that wasn't something that I believed was going to happen, but I took that as an approach. And as you know, every three weeks, I still keep that same approach going. So even though I've kept the business running, I, I look at it, the next three weeks is my last three weeks. The next three weeks is my last three weeks. Now, that mental approach, that mental attitude gets you into a thinking where you save money and you you really think about what should I be doing to what where do I earn the next quid? What do I do to replace it and all that sort of thing? So that's your that's your conservation and your conserving approach. My second approach, which you also know well about, is that I believe that business is going to improve significantly from about July one onwards. Now I don't think we're going to go back to where we were for a fair while. But I believe by July 1, I, and, and as you know, I said that a long time ago, so well before they started talking about lifting the, the restrictions, I, I reckon that it was going to play out around about July 1 will start to lift up. So if we look at July 1, and that's when I'm praying for rain, that's when I'm hoping for things to start to come back to me. That's when I'm hoping for my business to, to start to liven up and get a little bit of air in those lungs. Well... One of my sayings is there is no point praying for rain if you haven't got the dam built. All you'll happen is when the rain comes, you'll get flooded. What I mean by that is if everybody's thinking that we're going to just, it's all doom and gloom, you won't be thinking about July 1 and growing. So you won't be doing anything. And if you think that you're going to get somewhere in July 1 or August for you, whatever your strategy is, then if you're not planning for what you're going to be doing, when the doors open, what, you're then going to sit down and say to everybody, hey, just hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll write out my new strategy and my new plan. So, so people need to be looking at their business. You need to be doing an analysis. This is not a 64-page, 17-day journey that you have to go on. You, you should be able to punch this out. I, I do what I call a Mavros session, which is a strategy session, and that's a three-hour session. At the end of that session, I end up with what I want. And, and people should be able to punch out something within a two- to three-hour session. Okay, this is where I am. This is what I think is going to happen. This is my fallback plan, and away they go from there. And then happen, make it happen. It's, it's about your mindset. If you don't think it's going to happen, you ain't going to get there. It's as simple as that. And people want to tell me about all the problems and all the drama and the social distancing and all of that. Has anybody heard of a fellow called Nelson Mandela? Talk about social isolation. That guy was locked up. But what he said was, I can't change the circumstance, but I can master my attitude to it. Guy comes out of jail, becomes the president, and look what he did for this country. Look for he, for his country, and actually for our country, because he taught us all so many things. Martin Luther King. Man, we want to talk about we're not allowed to talk here. We can't go to the. They weren't even allowed to drink out of the same bubbler as other people, but that didn't stop him because his mindset created a groundswell. And that's where it gets going. So my advice to anybody listening, if you don't have a plan, you don't have a strategy, when the rain comes, you're just going to get flooded. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, some good stuff there for sure. And I guess I've heard them before because you've given these types of talks. You've run some sessions through uh, with, uh, with, with Eric uh, from BGES uh, on COVID-19 and things like that as well. But, I mean, on the patent side of things and from the inventors, um, do you think now is a good time to be, uh, you know, if, if people are downtime thinking, oh, what should we do next? Is it a good time to get creative and, and start coming up with inventions? What's your, or is there, is there always a good time or is there never a good time? Or what, what's, your, what's your feelings there? Um, the, the issue with inventions is this. If you've got a great idea 
and you don't tell anybody about it and you keep it in the bottom drawer and and it stays there, you're not the only person that can think of these things. So eventually somebody else comes out with something, oh, they stole my idea. No, you didn't do anything about it. If you go too hard too early, it can be a problem. Um, so at the moment, what people can do is fairly economically, they can register what's known as a provisional patent application. Now, the world doesn't see what's in it, but all a provisional does is it's you putting your hand up and saying, as of today's date, I'm claiming the rights to this idea. So you can do that provisional. Nobody sees what's in that provisional. You can be working on that for the next 12 months and you start to get that ready and you start to work out your strategy and you start to see if you're going to do anything with it. And then at the end of the 12 months, you can you, you, you start to spend dollars. Now, if nobody else has come out with it and if you think it's safe, you could refile your provisional. You lose the 12 months protection that you had, but you then can start it again. If, on the other hand, you business has picked up, COVID's gone and you've got a few dollars, you can then go into a number of strategies and, and move it forward. But within your business, most of your ideas and most of your innovations probably won't be covered by patents or, or protectionable ways in that way. So they'll become like what we know as trade secrets. But now's a great time to be preparing for the next idea and developing your next invention and developing your next step. As you know, Anthony, you and I are working on a number of things that we're just waiting for someone to turn the lights on and away we go. But um, so we, and we've done, we've done a lot of development work on a number of things. Um, <laughs> despite the fact that we had a bit of a hiccup this morning, this show has been something that started from you and I doing Zoom meetings, what, two months ago. And we've, We've gone all the way to you moving into this area and you and I talking about other shows and Eric and I doing um, our meetings and things like that. So evolution can't happen unless there's a starting point. That's stagnation. Yeah. So if there's no starting point, it, it's stagnation. If you get a starting point, that's evolution and development. So you've got to... I always say to people, you know, if you didn't do something about it yesterday, the next best time is today. Yeah, some good stuff. Um, so where will I go to next? I guess um, you've got uh, some tips. So tips going through. Oh, no, sorry. That was come to me. That's where I wanted to go. So uh, in the past, you've helped me sort of negotiate, you know, some curly situations. It seems like I can come to you with any uh you know sort of problem of mine whether it's business or outside of business and you either have the answer or know how to solve it or you'll pick up your phone and within a few minutes you'll put me in touch with the person that can so i mean if there's businesses that are that are going through what you know some of those situations might be a bit concerned about cash flow and you know some of their liabilities and things like that what type of advice do you have for them and i know you probably you know probably able to help a lot of them too by by negotiating but what type of advice would you have for them well, for a start, I never seek advice from somebody that knows less about something than me. Um, when, when I was raising my four children and, and I'm now in a situation where they're all off my hands, they're in their 30s, um, my grandson um, is um, now nine to 20, 21 uh, and I've got two lovely granddaughters. Um, I always ask somebody that had had children longer than me, not people that had gone and done the TAFE course or the or just come out of university and have a piece of paper. Now, I'm not knocking those people because you've got to start somewhere. But if you've not had life experience, if people have not, have not actually had skin off their knees, they don't know what that feels like. So, number one, the advice that you get should be from people that have the experience in the area that you want to talk. Life experience, not textbook experience. As you know, Anthony, my training courses, my one-day seminars and all of that, that comes from my life experience. Yes, I have a grad dip from university, but I have an MBA in life. So, I, my, and that's my, that's my value to the people. Um, 
my mentors, my advisors are people that, that eat, sleep and drink the particular area. So, so number one, find somebody that, that's got skills and knowledge and experience in the area that you want to be in or the problem that you need solving. Find somebody that's actually commercial in their thinking, not technical. Now, I'll give you an example. The reason my patent attorney and I work so well together, the reason my litigation lawyer and I work so well together, the reason my um, any of my professional consultants that I use work together so well, they give me the technical, they give me the the, the the out of the textbook. They give me the paragraph four, subparagraph six, da, 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 da. What I bring to the conversation, as you well know from a recent negotiation I did for you, is the commercial reality. And sometimes people get hung up. Uh, you, you could go to a patent attorney and say, is this patentable? Answer will be yes or no. Now, you come to me and I'll say, yes, it is but you're never going to sell it in a million years because of this commercial reality. Or no, it's not, but you can still go to market and make money out of it doing this, this and this. So with my, uh, there's a, a, a matter that I'm looking after for a client at the moment um, and my litigation lawyer has, has gone through and given me all the chapters and verses and paragraphs and blah, 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 blah. And I just sent off an email to the other party uh, last night for my client and, and, and explained to them, well, this is the technical and here's the commercial and here's an idea for a thing that we could just shake hands and all go about our business. Um, and they've already come back to me this morning and, and they want to have a, a chat today. So um, um, so try and find somebody that's, that's going to give you the answer. But, but make sure you're getting, you're getting the, the right answer to the right question. So, so is this yeah. patent? Yes or no? That's not the right answer to the right question. Is this patentable? Yes or no? And whatever answer you give me, can I do something with it? And is it commercially viable? Now you've got a series of the right questions with hopefully you get a right answer. Yeah, and fantastic. The one expert, the one expert that I can guarantee your 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 listeners is absolutely one hundred and fifty percent wrong. Is the arm bending expert, and they're the ones that you oh, meet at the bar. And Jimmy's good at drinking beers and scooies, and he can tell you how to fix your marriage. He can tell you how to fix the patent. He can tell you how to fix this. And all they are is an arm-bending expert. They're not a professional. And if you think professionals cost you money, wait until you deal with an amateur and see how much they can cost you. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. I think I've used that line in one of my uh, presentations as well. So just onto the sales thing, and I think I asked this in one of your other sort of Zoom presentations, and I might catch you off guard with this. I'm not sure if you've been preparing, but... Um, you know, in, you know, with your sales experience and, and you know, the generations of knowledge in there, what's some advice you have from, for someone now selling through through Zoom? How would you change or would you change anything uh, at all while selling through, or you know, using the technology? You know, because, of course, I know you're a big promoter of, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the other aspects of, of sales, which is the relationship building and all of those kinds of things. And how do you overcome that with the, with the distance and through the, through the, through the screen? Okay, so the number one thing that people need to understand, if you're counting elephants, one and one makes two. The extraordinary thing in life is if you're counting apples, one and one still makes two. That is a fundamental. It is just a fundamental. You can change the environment. You can change the articles. You can change... The, the people you're working with, but one and one makes two. In selling, if I understand my client, if I truly care about my client, if I understand my market, if I understand my product, my service, 
if I understand my offering, if I understand my pricing, I should be successful. If I do that one-on-one -on -one and I know all of that stuff, I will win one person at a time. If I do it to a room of four or five people, I could win four or five people at a time. If I do it wrong, I can wipe out one person at a time, four or five people at a time. The only thing that online does, whether it's being um, uh, e-marketing or whatever, it allows you to be competent with a whole lot more people at the one time, like whoever's watching us now, or incompetent with a whole lot of people at the one time. So there's people that are watching this that like me and there's people that are watching this that maybe don't like me. The difference between this and when I go down the street and meet one-on-one -on -one is I have that same impact, but I do it on a broader base. If you do not understand the basics of sales, you will not succeed online. If you don't understand about looking after your customer, if you don't understand about pricing to make a sufficient margin but not so big to allow your opposition to come in, you won't succeed online. You'll have a blip and a gone. Right? Relationships yeah. are relationships. Now, this medium makes it a bit harder. But the one thing that I liked, and when you asked me if you if I'd come on to be interviewed, the thing I like about this, just like we saw this morning, yours is raw, yours is natural. So whoever's watching you and me, this is who I am, this is what I stand for. And if that doesn't suit, that's okay, walk on by. But if it does suit, then you know what you're seeing now from Anthony and George is real. And that's who we are. We don't pretend to be somebody that we're not. You know, I don't, I, I'm, this, this business about fake it until you make it, let's, let's have a look at that. Fake it until you make it. Pretend you can do this until you can do it. Who the hell wants to start a relationship with somebody that starts off by lying to you? Yeah. I, I don't. Know. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, I am a bit of a roughie. I come from Fairfield and I'm proud of that. I'm a Westie. Uh, I, I, I went from Fairfield, which is western suburb Sydney, to Northbridge, which is upper class, upper shore at the age of nine. But I never forgot where I came from and I never forgot the people. I'm me. So I don't talk with a plum in my mouth. I talk as I talk. And if you like the way I talk, fine. I had a business partner once, and this is a true story, not an exaggeration. We used, Back in those days, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have, I don't even think we had email in those days. Um, um, so Gavin would write these wonderful letters to, to a prospective new client. And um, good morning, Mr. Pinto. Uh, I noticed your product, blah, 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 blah. You could hear this plum in his mouth and, and it was very refined and all of that. And I used to write letters to people. And he used to have about two to three times the number of people would, would come into the office through our, through our receptionist and all that, make an appointment to come in and meet Gavin. So he would have two to three times the people that would come in to, to the people that used to respond to my letters, okay? When the people came in, my strike rate was better than 85%. Better than eight and a half people that came into my office out of 10 signed up in some way, shape or form with me. His strike yeah. rate was less than 15%, less than 1.5 out of 10. Now, the reason for that is that Gavin used to be a cook, a commercial cook, on commercial ships, and if anybody's had anything to do with commercial shipping lines in the kitchen, you'll know they don't bloody talk real refined in there, mate. And Gavin was a, a was was a, a lovely fellow. He's a, an ex pomp. So when you walked into the office to Mr. Gavin Barclay, who had sent you this letter, Mr. Pinto, about 
communicating with you on this thing, the first thing that would happen is, "Guy, okay, mate, how you going? Like, come come and have a seat over here, and uh, let's 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 have a bit of a a, a cheese and talk about uh, what you got." And how's the missus? And people would come in and they'd sort of go, "Who the hell is this?" Compared to that letter. <laughs> yeah. So he faked it, and then when they'd come in, he didn't make it. So what we did is we changed our approach and I got him to change his letters and our strike rate started to be about the same. A lot of people didn't respond. Oh, that's a story, yeah. But everybody that came in, they weren't expecting a plum in the mouth, right? So be who you are and then find the people. Many years ago, there was a thing done on me. Uh, it's been done three times on me by people trying to prove that I'm no good at a job, and each time it's got me the job. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, first time it was done, 30% of people that met me for the first time thought I was brash, I was rude, I was arrogant, and 70% of people thought I was straight down the line, I said it as it is, and there was no, no airs and graces about me. Funny thing, same sort of quality, right? but they just saw interpreted a different way. About 10 years later, funny enough, I've matured a bit, somebody else decided to do this analysis and it came back 75-25. Ah, so I've learned to tone it down a bit. About 10 or 12 years after that, it was done for the third time without my knowledge. Each time this was done without my knowledge, by the way, um, and it came back to 80-20. Now, my theory on that is each 10 years... I matured a bit, I learnt a bit, got a bit more grey hair and managed to bite my tongue a little bit more than I did. So, Anthony, if you think I say some wild things now, imagine what I was like <laughs> back then. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. But, but when it got to that point, I started to change. When I do my public talks and my presentations where I'm trying to get people in to talk to me and meet me, I decided I'd just do what I'm doing because my theory was if I'm in a room of, of 100 people, 20 of them don't like me. That's okay. 80 of them do. So I'm not trying to win the 20. I'll work with the 80. Yeah. You stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. each of every one of you listening to this right now. If you think you have to be the same as me or the same as him or the same as her, why do we have 12 different coaches in football? Why do we have 12 different coaches at the top level of basketball? Why do we have 450 different places where you can get mechanical services done on cars? Why do we have so many different accountants? Why do we have so many different anythings? Because one size does not fit all. So be who you are and then take it to the market. I don't care whether that's face-to-face, -face, in a room full of five to 500 people or on the internet. Just be who you are. Yeah, that's great. Really good advice. I mean, even as I'm, you know, I've heard a lot of this from you before, I think, but even, even as I'm hearing from you again now, it's like, yeah, internalising a lot of it going, yeah, I think I can improve some things in what I do for sure. But just back to that sales experience, and I think, I guess, with all of the years that you've been in business and doing things, you, you must have seen many of these black swan type events, um, you know, GFC. I mean, I was, I still remember the GFC, but, you know, that was probably the first time in business that I was actually paying attention. Before that, I was, was too young and not in business for the dot-com bubble exactly and stuff. I was employed at the time. But what, you know, in, in all of the ones that you've seen, you know, what have you seen as a, as a common thread in the impact to business, the ones that make it, the ones that don't make it? all of that kind of stuff. What type of qualities do business owners have that, that, that do well and, and, and what are some of the qualities that you think people should be avoiding? Okay, so so the, the number one thing that I find in, um, and yes, uh, at age 64, um, COVID is, is the latest. Uh, the GFC I went through, um, um, the wonderful, wonderful Paul Keating, um, the recession we had to have and the J curve, Boy, did that do us a lot of good. Um, we went through the uh, union troubles when, um, the, in particular, the Libs and the unions decided to see who was going to win that argument and, and, and the rest of the world was cannon fodder. And I'm not saying either party was right or either party was wrong. It's just the way it, it all gelled out. The one thing that's common 
in the survival in all of that is the person that can adapt. The person that, uh, you know, today's word is pivot. If you can pivot your business, um, pivot, adapt, adopt, change, um, dodge and weave, whatever you want to call it. If, if um, yet another of my funny sayings, Anthony, if you don't spend half your time worrying about what's going wrong, you have double the time to get something to work. If you don't spend half your time worrying about what's going wrong, you've got double the time to get something to work. So the common thread for me in all of these things are the businesses that not have been ruthless and ripped apart their staff and gotten rid of all their connections and it's all about me. It's the businesses that have said, hang on, I'm in trouble here. What's the best way that I can work my way through this? What's fair, what's honourable, what's ethical? And then, yeah, sometimes you've got to make some tough decisions in that, but try and do it as best you can. Um, so it's it's adapting. It's about caring for everybody else because at the end of the day, when this is all over, I'm going to remember the companies that just left me high and dry and I'm going to remember the companies that still tried to help me out. I'm going to remember if my employer just ripped my head off and said, see you later, uh, or they they tried to help me through. I'm going to remember who truly worried about me and who really didn't give a damn. So over the all of these crises that I've seen over the last 40 years in business, and even before that, uh, you know, my mum and dad's business went pear-shaped when, when they had a takeaway shop, which relied on passing traffic, the freeway was put down the end of the road. Nobody had to pass our shop. They were in trouble. And they, the, the shop virtually went went from 100 to zero in um, a matter of weeks. Um, so we had to adopt what we were doing and adapt to what we were going where we were going there. So think about what can I do differently? Is there things that I can save money on right now? Spend more money on marketing if you don't have customers that can buy. Let me explain that to you. If you have a product or a service at the moment that you can actually sell and people have money to buy it, then spend less money on marketing, more money on advertising. I'll explain the two in a minute. If you don't have something that people can buy from you right now, make better connections, make better friends, make new connections, make new friends so that when they are ready to buy, they can remember you and they'll come back to you. So what is the difference? Marketing is about, if you're thinking about a service or a product, come and see me because I'm the best at this particular service or product. Advertising is about selling something that they can buy right now from you. So in times are tough, if you've got something that people have to buy, and need to buy and will buy at the moment, do advertising. For example, we got the best tomatoes in town. I got I got apples six for a dollar. I've got the lamb chops. I've got this. I've got that. Come and come in today and buy your food from me today. This is a deal for me today, right? Yeah. Now, at the moment, probably promoting a trip to Bali or, a, a, or, a, or a, a, a cruise on an ocean liner, if you're going to spend money advertising right now, you're going to, you might as well just go and get that sink, take the, just pull the sink away, take the tap, put, put it down the tap hole and away you go, the sinkhole, sorry, not the tap. So you would be better off saying, hey, listen, things will get better. And when all of this is done, and you're thinking about taking a trip somewhere, just remember, XYZ Travel Agency, we do experiences. We will give you a trip and an experience that will help you put all of this behind you better, faster, more economically than all our competitors. Come and see us when you're ready. That's the marketing. Okay? Yeah, so I'm sold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So we've right. got... We've got a business at the moment 
um, where we sell um, what, are, what are known as changing places pods. And they're for people with disabilities that are severely disabled in wheelchairs. These, these things have a hoist in them. They've got a toilet, a shower, a sink, a change table. So these are people that are, are, are taken somewhere by their carer. And, and what happens is, yes, you, you've got disabled toilets, but some of these some of these people um, are so disabled and that, that that sadly they they will soil themselves. So they need to be changed. You can't do that in a disabled toilet. You need a changing places pod. So we're we're selling those and we're hiring those out to organisations at the moment. And we've we've got a business that's increasing because there's a lot of people that are disabled at, in hospitals that they want to get them out of hospital and get them to home but the bathroom doesn't work for them. We have a portable ensuite, so we're leasing them out. So that's what we're selling at the moment. What we're marketing at the moment is the other side of our business that does building and access ramps and and um, so people that that um, want to come to your, your business or your, your home or whatever and they need an access ramp to get in. Um, there's not a lot of people visiting a whole lot of places at the moment, so there's not a lot of uh, access ramps being installed. So that's what we're marketing at the moment. When you're ready to get an access ramp, come and see Australian Ramps and Access. Now, there is one area that that business is growing in, and that's in education and government departments because they're trying to do stimulation and get projects going and, and all that sort of thing. So we're selling the ramp services and the ramp range into education and government departments, but we're marketing those services to the broader consumer or the broader market for us. So understand, am I, should I be advertising today or should I be marketing today? Now, some meetings I could be just marketing. Some meetings I could be advertising. And in some cases, you could do a little bit of both. But think wisely about where you're spending your dollar. Who are you talking to? Why are you talking to? Where are you talking to them? When are you talking to them? And what are you talking to them about? That's what you need to be thinking. Yeah. Fantastic. I think some really good advice there for, for everyone that's, uh, you know, going through this and might have a, sort of an uncertain outlook for the for the future, some things to focus and get their mind out of the negative and into some of the positive things that they can be doing. Um, yep. The last thing I wanted to chat with you before we wrap up, I, I know we could probably go for hours and hours, you and I, but, we, but we're probably going to start wrapping up. It's at 47 minutes. Um, I know during the bushfires, you did a lot of bushfire relief uh, relief work, dropping caravans off to places and things like that, and you do a lot of stuff for charities. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the charities you're involved in or, or any of those that you'd like to, uh, you know, get some more, more awareness on today? Um, so I, I try to look after charities that are not the sexy ones, that are not the ones that are likely to get a whole lot of dollars from, from elsewhere. Um, and I try to do things that are... Um, that um, as best as possible we can get dollars right to the to the the source. Um, so yeah, um, friend of mine, his his family, four members of the same family in different houses, got wiped out at um, uh, Shell Harbour uh, on New Year's Eve, and um, so I lent my caravan to um, uh, his uh, his uh, nephew and his partner. For them to to live in um, while they rebuilt themselves a little granny flat, um, and my my caravan set up that you, it's got a, a, a hot water system and, and proper kitchen and double bed and um, a, uh, it's got an outside shower but it, it's it's nevertheless it's a shower, so I lent that to them, um, and then, but I still wanted to go away camping, so I went and bought myself a, an El Cheapo. Uh, camper trailer uh, for um, and and I decided I'd use that for a while because I didn't feel I didn't feel it was fair to say to his nephew give me back the caravan uh, so I said keep it until you're ready and I'll I'll just buy this other one so now with the camper trailer um, I was going to just use that and then sell it um, when I've finished but I've decided to keep it and I'm going to um, uh, rent it out to people like hundred dollars for a weekend, and normally this, this camper trailer would probably go out at three fifty, four hundred dollars for a 
for a two day hire. Mine will go out for about a hundred bucks. But it's got to do. It's got to be to people that are that are doing it tough, um, or, or want to experience, or their caravan's broken and they can't get to a meet. I'll help them out. And that money, I'm going to donate that to to my charities. So the charities I look after at the moment, or the main ones I look after at the moment, one's called Achieve Australia, um, which um, is um, looks after people predominantly that suffer from Down syndrome. Um, I look after a charity um, which is um, the Parkinson's um, uh, Society, um, and they get terrible, terrible funding from governments and, and, and even big corporates don't really know a lot about them. It's not, it's not a high topic, uh, but Parkinson's is a, is a horrid disease and I lost my mum to it. So uh, that's my connection oh, there. To hear. Um, and I saw what it did to that woman and, and uh, yeah, terrible. Uh, we'll get off that topic because I'll start crying again. Um, <laughs> um, and then I also, there's another organisation um, um, which is um, uh, to do with cancer, and that's the Leukemia Foundation. Now, there's numbers of different cancer uh, research centres that you can support. The reason I picked the Leukemia Foundation is that they they concentrate on all the rarer disorders. So, so there's there's a whole lot of people doing stuff for breast cancer and the lung cancer and this cancer and that cancer. The Leukemia Foundation works on all these 1% cancers and the, the rarer uh, blood disorders and all of that. They do a lot of work with children. And what people, a lot of people don't know, cancer, we, we if we talk about a, um, a broken bone, snap, it's a break. If we talk about a strain or a sprain, it's a stretch. And we talk about cancer as though it's a one dimensional thing. It's not. Cancer starts off, uh, it mutates, I forget how many hundreds of times. It's like, a bit like the flu. Um, the cancer we're dealing with today, we, we, get, we get a cure for it, but the mutation tomorrow and the mutation the next day and the next month and the next thing, that's the one that, that's causing the problem. And that's why we don't necessarily get on top of it because we beat the first one, then the second one, then the third one and the fourth one. Leukemia Foundation spends a lot of time in those rarer ones. And so from their work, where they deal with one rare thing, it actually, um, if you imagine it, radiates out and can, can do benefits to a whole lot of things. Um, so so I look, at, I look at those sorts of things. And I started a thing, uh, which I'm not going to take up all the time here, about but um, if anybody wants to know more about stuff like that, uh, I, I'm happy for them to hit me up. I, I've got a project which is called the sixty-four thousand dollar question, and what I'm trying to find out is can I influence or can I help raise uh, sixty-four thousand dollars for charities in my sixty-fifth year of, of being on this earth? Um, it's called the sixty-four thousand dollar question because it marries into a, a, a show. But if you want to know more about that, uh, people can hit me up about that later on. Um, but that's about just doing random things for people. Um, I went to Bonalbo uh, last year, which is a small town, uh, had 100, 130 people in it, and our camping group went up there and we delivered 225 people to the town. So the town went from 130 to 350 overnight. Um, we delivered in excess of fifty thousand dollars worth of money into their community. Uh, the local, the, lo the local uh, bowling club, their biggest night ever. They did thirty-three meals for people. One night we were there, they did a hundred and thirty-five dinners, and we did a hundred <laughs> meals. Uh, uh, not not all dinners, but desserts and all that. We did 100 meals down at the local pub on the same night. So between our group, we ended up with 235 meals, dinners, whatever, in between those two organisations. Now, there's a there's a local market that they have and everybody makes cakes and trinkets and all of that. There's only 130 people in the place. So they all turn up at the hall each week 
I've made a cake and your wife buys it off me and you, you've made something and I buy it off you. So all the money is really just coming from the community to the community. So I, I motivated a whole heap of people and we went down to the Bonalbo swap meet and I, I went and took out $250 um, um, just out of my account and I, and I got it in $10 notes. And what I did is I went around to the different stalls and, and one of the stalls there was two little girls helping their, their mum out selling trinkets and that. And I said to the girls, if you were going to get something for yourself in this $5 range, uh, what, would you, what would you pick? And the girls picked an item each, which was $5 each, and I said, well, you take them from me and I just gave the lady $10. She was blown away. The kids were blown away. I was blown away because I love seeing that reaction. I didn't need anything for me. I bought a dozen eggs from, from one stall and I went over to the ladies that, that working the, um, the, the raffle for the local hospital and I gave them the dozen eggs and I said, look, you give these, they were duck eggs actually, um, free-range duck eggs, and I gave them the dozen eggs and I said, you work out in town who could, who could benefit from them most and give half a dozen to each of them. And then I bought, I, I, I said, oh, you're doing a raffle? And they said, yeah. And I said, um, how much are the tickets? And they said, oh, um, they're, um, they're five, five, for, five for five dollars, five, five for three dollars or ten Ten for um, five dollars, ten dollars or whatever. Anyway, I bought. I said, I said, oh, I'll have ten dollars worth. So, so they said, oh, okay, fair enough. Would you like to fill in that? And I said, no. And she looked at me, said, what? I said, no. She said, well, well, you've got to fill the tickets in. I said, no, I'm not doing that. I said, there's the ten dollars. You put five under your name, and you put five under your name. I said, I don't. I'm not going to be here. Now. The reason I do it, the lift that you give to those people, the, the, the joy that you see on their face, it's unreal. Every single person that I know, if they each just gave $10, we could, we could raise money like there's no tomorrow. For, to get to $64,000, I need a few people here to take that story and, and come up with your idea. And you multiply it out, $10 each by $10 each by $10 each. That's it. Thank you for letting me share that, Anthony. Yeah, no worries. No, it's a great story. And I think that's why we've always got along with sort of similar mindset and uh, sort of business attitude and aptitude in that way. So, look, once again, look, really sorry we've got to wrap this up. We could go forever. And I think we'll get you back on in a little while as well to to, to share some different things because there's lot, lots of information and, uh, you know, with your experience there. Um, so, Everyone, thanks for tuning in today, um, and I hope you've got some good information about, you know, the difference between advertising and marketing, working on your strategy, building the dams before the rain comes when we all get lifted. If you've got some ideas and, and uh, that you'd like to, you know, consider patenting, or if you just want some general advice on running your business, uh, you know, you know how to get in contact with George. He's here to help. Um, so once again, if you like these types of conversations and find some value in them, um, you know, Please be sure to like, subscribe, comment, share this around, invite some other people to join the conversation. We'll be running one every day uh, until we run out of people to talk to. But at the moment, there seems to be no shortage. Um, apologies for the little hiccup we had earlier today. That's that's just technology. We'll, we'll work on those for future as well. Uh, tomorrow, once again, we've got Jenny Godfrey from Concept Designs on the northern beaches of Sydney. Her, and she'll be talking about how her digital marketing business has been helping uh, businesses do well uh, on the marketing and advertising side as well. So we hope to sort of wrap that up. All right. With all of that being said, thank you for joining us. We'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, George. Thanks again. Thanks, mate.